everyone doing on this Saturday morning, afternoon? <laughs> I'm um, sorry for the technical delay, we just had a few technical issues to get sorted out, but we'll get started right now. So, hello and welcome to the first ever Penn Neuroscience Society Research Expo. Um, <laughs> firstly, Ollie and I would like to personally thank each and every one of you for joining us here today. We know it's um, a beautiful afternoon during spring fling, but um, as this will be like a yearly occurrence, we'll definitely check our uh, calendars more closely when planning out the date. We did ask class board to reschedule the spring fling, but they yet to get back to us about that, so that's, that's their fault. But um, yeah, so that's to minimize our time inside. Um, we'll just get right, uh, get right with it. Um, so yeah, so uh, after Ali and I finished talking, um, we are super excited to welcome Dr. Jason Carlowish to be our keynote speaker for today. After this, and um, and then after that. Uh, we'll be moving on to the actual research poster um, presentations, as you can see, set up in the back. And during that, as promised, there will be uh, food and refreshments for you guys as you're walking around and engaging with the posters. And um, so after that, um, after uh, just to close out the to close out the conference, all I now will just be sharing our thoughts on our our takeaways from running research community this year. Cool. So. Can you guys hear me? If you'll indulge us a little bit, I guess I'd just like to talk a little bit about our research committee and the membership that I've worked with for the last year. So what even is research committee? Well, we're the premier appendage of the Penn Neuroscience Society. Last year, as part of the society's revival, Aaron and I designed a year-long soft curriculum, which centered around weekly Sunday meetings. And it was with the aim of cultivating a nuanced understanding of scientific writing and how scientific knowledge is produced in this glacial, cumulative, thorough process, when done at its best, at least. We decided to work with 15 highly motivated underclassmen, one junior, uh, whose interest in neuroscience extends beyond pop trivia or hallmark neuroscience. And hopefully you will get a chance to see all of their presentations today. Uh, as you will soon see, our members are some of the brightest minds on campus, um, but I'll just leave that up to them to prove to you. One other thing about the research committee was, has been our goal to cultivate a sense of community. We organize pre-professional workshops, guest speeches, and committee socials outside of our weekly Sunday meetings to better understand our social and academic identities. Um, whether or not has, that has been a success, I guess two of our members are rooming together next year, so I'll say that Aaron and I have had at least a single lasting impact. Um, Let's see. And then, if you'll indulge me for even a little bit longer, I would also just talk, like to talk about uh, the theme that we selected for this year's annual expo. So when designing a conference, especially an annual one, it was important for Anna and I to pick a theme which coheres the intellectual content you're going to be seeing, but which wouldn't shoehorn our committee's various inclinations. Uh, so for this year, we picked I guess, biotechnology or neurotechnology. And when we were sharing that idea with our membership, we had said, well, think of neurotechnology very broadly construed. Everybody has some kind of idea of what technology is. Technology is, you know, everything from fire, the Dewey Decimal System, the automobile. So think of neurotechnology in the same broad sense. It doesn't have to be necessarily some kind of futuristic implant or the like. It could be but it could just also be some kind of post-surgical, neurosurgical assessment that someone has designed. And what coheres all these different kinds of bio or neurotechnologies is just the thought that goes into them, the innovation they bring to the table, and the way that they improve the lives and the brains and minds of the people that they were designed for. Um, so yeah, innovation, with the lives of those around us, just the boundaries, neuroscience. And so many of you are probably wondering, this is definitely a new thing that Research Committee has done this year, so why a conference? So when Ali and I were planning out what Research Committee would look like for this year back in the summer of last year actually, we were thinking, how can we get Research Committee to integrate with the larger Penn community? So I proposed a way to showcase the work that Research Committee actually does every Sunday throughout the year. And so we wanted to provide a pathway for students to get connected with research opportunities while exploring a wide range 
wide-ranging facets of what neuroscience can actually be. So, similar to what the Stark Expo was like in Iron Man 2, we wanted to integrate the society with a larger Penn community, allow faculty outreach, and allow an opportunity to meet new people and explore research opportunities across the campus. Okay, we'll be out of your hair soon, but before we do that, I just want to say that I'm super excited to welcome Dr. Jason Karlowish as today's keynote speaker. He researches and writes about issues at the intersections of bioethic, aging, and the neurosciences. He's the author of The Problem of Alzheimer's, How Science, Culture, and Politics Turned a Rare Disease into a Crisis, and What We Can Do About It, and the novel Open Wound, The Tragic Obsessions of Dr. William Beaumont, and has written essays with the New York Times, the Washington Post, Forbes, the Hill, Stad, Philadelphia Inquirer. Regarding Penn, he's a professor of medicine, med medical ethics, and health policy and neurology at the University of Pennsylvania, and is the co-director of the Penn Memory Center where he cares for patients. He currently lives in Philadelphia. Everybody, please welcome Dr. Jason Carlowitz. Thanks a lot. Great to be here. I, uh, yeah, competing with spring flight. Wow. That's uh, big stuff. So. <laughs> I actually remember when I was in college freshman year at Northwestern, they had something called, uh, I don't know, spring flight, whatever. And I kind of didn't know about it. And uh, on Saturday, I got up and I went to the library. Like, There's no one here. <laughs> <laughs> and like, then I began to hear music on the lakefront. I'm like, I think there's something going on. So, so that's my story. Uh, so uh, it's great, great to be here. This is a real thrill. It's, uh, I think it's a particularly thrill to see how neuroscience is really coming into its own as an undergraduate, as a, as a, a major discipline. Um, and uh, I think the future for neurosciences uh, across a variety of sciences that tap into, that claim to be neuroscience is really quite exciting. Uh, I, I'm a doctor, I just have an MD, I don't have any um, other degrees or I have no training whatsoever in neurosciences. Um, I'm, I'm a, a, a geriatrician, meaning I trained in internal medicine, I did additional training in geriatric medicine. Um, actually, when I left, uh, uh, Residency towards the end of it, I was actually going to go into critical care uh, and run an ICU. Um, and for a variety of reasons, I switched to geriatrics. Um, which is probably the only person in the history of critical care to make that switch. Geriatrics is a very undersubscribed field. In any given year, about 200 people go into it. Um, so I'm probably the least qualified person to speak to you about uh, anything to having to do with neuroscience. Um, nonetheless, here I am. Um, because I guess what I wandered into. Um, to some degree, uh, I, I say wander because it was a bit of serendipity, um, but I began to focus on issues. My er scientific interest actually was more, I guess, a humanities interest, I would say, I had an interest in bioethics, and I was doing some work in that University of Chicago as, as a fellow, um, and, and during that time made my switch to, 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 to uh, dementia, and I'll explain why that was such an important focus as opposed to Alzheimer's disease. Um, in a moment. And, and that merging of bioethics and dementia made a lot of sense given issues of research ethics. Um, so that goes back to the last century. And anyway, I ended up here at the University of Pennsylvania and I've been here ever since. And so to take you up to the present time, I help run our Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. We call it the ADRC. It's a National Institute of Aging funded center uh, that um, has multiple investigators running a variety of different cores. Uh, to advance science training and uh, care of persons living with Alzheimer's disease and related other diseases. Um, and uh, I helped run the overall center. Uh, the director is David Wolk, a neurologist, um, and myself and Eddie Lear, the associate directors. Eddie is a neuropathologist, but uh, uh, he runs the PATH core aspects. I run that outreach recruitment and engagement core to bring people into research, and I run the training core, and then I run my research uh, group and much of what I'll talk about is coming out of the research that we've been doing for a number of years. And as your colleague mentioned, I'm also a writer. If you want to learn more about my writings, everyone's got one, a web page. Um, so you just go to my web page. This is my name, jasoncarlish.com. And much of what I'm talking about today is sort of developed in greater detail in the book that, that thank you, Ollie, for mentioning it, The Problem of Alzheimer's. So by all means, have a look at that. So, um, you know, I don't know what you 
it's funny how you know time carries on for decades, centuries. Nothing seems to happen, and all of a sudden, lots happens. Um, and yet, a lot can happen in just a short period of time. We have only the last two years to sort of testify to that, don't we? Um, in terms of what's happened in our uh, country, um, and uh, as well as events in the last month or two over in Europe, sadly. Um, in the story of Alzheimer's disease, a lot has happened in the last 20, 30 years. Um, the word revolution isn't an understatement. Um, and it's a transformation of how we think about what are the, what is this disease really leading to us to understand what are these diseases. So what the hell is he talking about? Well, when I started out, just to ground it in the narrative, the way you thought about Alzheimer's disease as a clinician was, you could almost sum up in a bumper sticker, no dementia, no Alzheimer's disease, NL. So if someone didn't have dementia, and I'll explain what that is in a minute, you wouldn't bother to even think whether they had Alzheimer's disease, okay? You could now play on this wordplay game, and bear with me for a minute, the groans might become audible, K-N-O-W, dementia, K-N-O-W, Alzheimer's disease. If you don't know what dementia is, you wouldn't know what Alzheimer's was, so just bear with me. So what was going on there was that to make a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease, you needed to first say that the patient, the individual, had dementia. And if they had dementia and you concluded that, your next step was, well, what disease is causing this? Um, and the most common disease, the disease we all generally ran to, was Alzheimer's disease. Sometimes you'd throw vascular in the mix. In fact, just as a little digression, if you were a geriatrician or internist, if you even got that far, and you're thinking, you looked at the CAT scan, saw a lot of white matter type disease and called it vascular. If you were a neurologist, you called it Alzheimer's. It's a very interesting difference. I won't develop that more. So what's dementia? Um, uh, in addition to being a stigmatized term, uh, what it describes is disabling cognitive impairments. My hunch is when you've heard that word, you've already had a series of associations in your mind. In other words, I ask you what, if I ask you what words come to mind when you hear the word dementia, my hunch is, is that, uh, I mean, if you could do this exercise, I won't break the fourth wall and have you do it, but they're probably not very pleasant words, and they're probably not very pleasant images. And I have a hunch some of you have personal experience with dementia, and it's probably universally um, sad and disappointing. You know, the stereotype of dementia is someone who, as a result of um, a brain disease, can't bathe, dress, groom, feed, and toilet independently needs help. And there's no question at a certain stage of, of some of the dementing illnesses, those are the kinds of disabilities the person has. But years before those disabilities, years, plural, are a host of other disabilities. Um, namely, troubles self-determining one's life. So, for example, the classic story at the Penn Memory Center where I see patients just over in PCAM, just a block or two away, um, the classic story is uh, not quite sure what was going on with dad, but then uh, I got a call from the condo association that he hadn't paid his bill in three months. And I uh, kind of took the courage to call his broker, and his broker says, yeah, he calls up and wants to do the same trade every day. A couple times he's done that, he already did that trade. Um, uh, the other classic story is Thanksgiving came around, we were counting on the great meal that everyone always thought, you know, was the highlight of the, of, the ho of the holiday, and grandma couldn't do it. You know, we had to, like, rescue her from the kitchen. Uh, and I could go down that list of these, what in the world of geriatrics we call instrumental activities of daily living. Namely, someone having trouble managing money, using transportation to travel from one place to the other, uh, cleaning the house, cooking a meal, uh, choosing what to watch on TV and watching it and following the show. So a lot of families will say, yeah, he doesn't really read books anymore. Or, you know, like, you know, you can't handle TV series. The episode, the carryover from one episode to the other is just not happening anymore. Long before there are troubles with bathing, dressing, grooming, feeding, and toileting. That's the story of dementia. And the reason why I bring that up is because if you think about it, aren't those those things that let you be you? It sounds very quotidian, you know, bathing, dress, uh, ex uh, managing money, medicine, cell phone, transportation. Sort of like they're going to now go into a lecture on social work. No, at all, uh, diminishment of the role of social workers. But, you know, we're here for neuroscience, right? GABA ergic transmission, pyramidal neurons, you know, cortical layers, you know, white matter tracks, optogenetics. And you're talking to me about managing money, you know, ordering off a menu. 
and it is very quotidian stuff, but think about what you will enjoy later today. You know, when you go to Spring Fling, you'll have your choice of what you want to do. I don't want to hear about it, but you know, <laughs> you'll have your choice of what you want to do. You'll be self-determined in your life. You'll be shaping your identity. You'll be making you, you, which is what you've been doing here by coming here and doing what you've done as opposed to doing something else. And that's what dementia gets in the way of. Dementia means you're having trouble being you, self-determining your life. And I'll turn back to that later at the end when we talk more broadly about, well, what are the reasonable accommodations we put in place to address those disabling cognitive impairments? And I use that loaded term from law, the Americans with Disability Act, the idea of reasonable accommodations, because if you think about disability, the way I think most of you understand disability is it's physical disability, right? Skiing accident, oh, stretching, his spine was injured. And after that, you know, it's a wheelchair, you know, and a scooter, and a ramp, and, and like, you know, great, but back in the game again, right? Could even be skiing, depending on, you know, the skis that they develop or whatever. So most of us think of disability as a physical problem below the neck, but what I'm trying to at least appeal to you is think of disability also as a result of cortical problems, of cognitive problems. So that was the world I trained in, no dementia, no Alzheimer's. So if someone came in and you concluded based on your history, I don't think there are disabling cognitive impairments going on here. There's not a story of troubles with daily activities. Despite your memory complaints, okay, you wouldn't even bother to say they had Alzheimer's. You just kind of call up there and say, well, it's normal aging, it's uh, anxiety, a little depression, maybe some vascular disease, maybe you shouldn't be taking that many benzos, you know. I mean, you just you know, kind of give this, you know, maybe one less drink at night, whatever, you know. And then the world changed. It, and it changed, actually, the turn of the century. As we entered the 21st century, things began to happen rapidly and all at once. Not that too long ago is what I'm trying to say. And what happened was that we bridged the barrier. And the barrier that um, prevented really thinking about these diseases clinically was the skull. In other words, you know, everywhere else in the body, you can get a needle in it <laughs> or stick a tube up it and get it. Um, but the one thing that this organ does not admit is getting into it. And even if you can, you can drill into the skull, you know, it's not the kind of organ you easily biopsy, right? You can biopsy the liver, it's a very redundant organ, the kidney a very redundant organ, you know. But not the brain. You do a lesion there. Plus, where do you biopsy? Anyway, and everyone knew this. I mean, there's no secret. It wasn't like it was this relevant. Like, like our ability to understand whether you have this a disease of your brain is limited by the fact that we can never get the tissue. Plus, the blood-brain barrier uh, is, is, a, is a physiologic barrier as well that doesn't let a lot of stuff in or out of the brain except glucose, alcohol, and THC, um, and a few other things. Um, and so, what's my point? The revolution was the use of radio tracers to bind to the proteins that are abnormally shaped and folded in these diseases. And the first one that was done was right around 2000. And um, it was a pair of researchers at the University of Pittsburgh, Bill Clunk and Chet Mattis, who had spent a good 10 years working on a project that everyone said was a sideshow, imaging the garbage can, an abuse of radio labeled technology. It's not what it's for. It's supposed to label tracers, not pathology. And they just ignored all the critics as often great scientists do, and broke the paradigms. And in 2002, at the Stockholm meeting, showed the first image of a living human's brain, living human's brain, showing amyloid protein deposition in that brain. And that was the beginning of the revolution, that you could visualize at least one of the pathologies of Alzheimer's disease, not in a dead person, which had been the case up until then. You had to die to be told you had Alzheimer's, which is rather ghoulish, because you wouldn't be around to hear the news. Um, and now you could be told in life that you have elevated amyloid. Fast forward a few years later, 50, 10 years, that same technology then becomes fairly routine. Routine's a, a loaded word. And you can now image tau, the other protein that's abnormal. There are synuclein tracers being developed. I don't expect you to know what these words mean, but these various proteins that when misfolded seem to cause neurons to die, that's still being worked out. You could now begin to image them in the living human. And this is a revolution. We call those all biomarkers. You can also measure them in the spinal fluid. You can also begin to now measure them in the blood. So you can draw a tube of blood and begin to, and we're close to being able to say with real confidence that I can see, measure, tau protein in the blood of someone, uh, of a living human. 
And so what used to be hidden until you were very sick, disabled, now can be seen before you're disabled. That's the revolution, that you can see these diseases now in a living human before they come in saying, well, someone else comes in saying, uh, the Thanksgiving meal was a disaster, or he got lost on the way to go to the grandkids. He's done that drive 15 times, you know, for 15 years, and yet he got lost. You can pick it up long before there are those problems. Now, that ought to be really exciting, but let's, it should be. I mean, why would, why would you want to wait until you have a heart attack before you get a heart attack, right? And, and that paradigm operates, you know? Turn 50 or 40 now in America, actually, and you get a blood cholesterol test, and if it's elevated, you get a statin. And your blood pressure is checked any time you go to a healthcare practitioner to get an antihypertensive. We could debate how effective those drugs are, but the net data say they're effective enough to be worth their effort to reduce the chance of grabbing your chest and saying, I can't breathe, or saying, I can't lift my arm because of a stroke. We've embraced that. We're about ready to embrace that for the brain. Now, that's exciting, but the challenge that that presents is rather notable because there's something different about the brain compared to every other organ. Getting back to what I was talking about, that many consider it that which then allows us to be who we are. So let's talk, though, before we get to that, about some of the other implications. Well, you've now redefined the diseases. They're no longer defined based on having disabling cognitive impairments. They're defined based on pathology measures. When you do that, you change the count of the disease, how many people have it. Up until recently, you counted the disease by various quirky methods in epidemiology. I don't mean that meanly, but it's a very difficult disease to count, that counted how many people had cognitive impairment. Well, now you would say that's just one slice of the disease. We should be counting the biomarkers. So you rechange the numbers dramatically, but you change what those numbers mean because it's not about counting dementia. You also change how many people actually have it. So one of the great revelations, which was rather embarrassing to the field in the last 15 years, was that many folks we said had Alzheimer's didn't have Alzheimer's. It looked clinically like they had Alzheimer's, that is to say the story they told and their family told sounded a lot like Alzheimer's, but when you looked at the, for the pathologies that I've told you about using the biomark, you didn't see them. They're, they're, they weren't there or, or, or only one was there or others were there. And so all of a sudden the numbers be, have now been in great flux. And in fact, the more we study the brain of humans, the more we find that it's a very complicated set of pathologies that are at work across the lifespan in combination, which is exciting because it means there's a lot of different things to study, but also challenging from a public health perspective because it's not like there's just that one and only one RNA virus we've got to go after and tickle the vaccine. This isn't one disease with one set of problems. It's a very complicated disease. And that's okay. We can figure that out. So we're changing the way we define, therefore count, and therefore label. But what I wanted to spend some time talking about was changing the way we would treat the disease and to think about that. So it's all very well to have two, three, four years of a wilderness that's scary and whatnot to finally get an answer from a physician about what's going on and come up with a plan. But now we're talking about a future where your brain is labeled before there are problems. So think about that. What if I told you at the beginning of this talk that I have elevated amyloid and tau protein spreading beyond Brock stage three? The moment I forget a word or something, you'd say, there he goes. <laughs> Beginning of the end. What I'm getting at very vividly is, you know, walking around saying to people, I, I don't, I've never had the imaging, so I don't know yet. Uh, <laughs> but walking around saying to someone, oh yeah, I, I went to the doctor and you know, I've got uh, elevated amyloid and my, my P-tau test shows I've got probably tau deposition, particularly in my temporal lobes. So probably goes, you know, that, that probably explains why I'm having some of these memory problems. People are going to treat you very differently probably, aren't they? How would your employer treat you? I mean, would you want to go to an investment advisor who has preclinical Alzheimer's disease? You might, but you might also be a little worried. Would you want an airline pilot flying a plane who has evidence of biomarker pathology? Right now pilots for long haul flights, or whatever the term for flights is, that go a long distance. Um, I believe the mandatory retirement age is 55, 50, I could be wrong, but it's just an easy solution. Just get them out before this, the odds are they'll have problems. But what if you could do these tests instead? It, so I'm ginning up my argument here, but what I'm talking about is when we enter this new world where this disease, does, we don't wait for disability, but we pick it up 
when there's only mild symptoms at most, you're entering now into the world of people who are living their identity, living their lives, but now you're labeling them the disease. It's very stigmatizing. So think about how that would play out in employment situations. How would your co colleagues treat you? Think about how that would play out in your family situation. When you tell your family members, how would they begin to treat you? How would that play out amongst your social group? So we actually have done research in this, my group. Um, and the idea of sharing the result for many is a ethically, socially, morally charged decision. Now some are very frisky about it. I, I don't know, it's like on the news saying, I have the scan and I'm in this study to develop treatments for Alzheimer's, you know, CBS Evening News and whatnot. You know, can't get more public than that, I suppose. But others are much more guarded and will say, look, as one woman said in one of the studies, this isn't a colonoscopy. A colonoscopy is not going to change who I am. This changes who I am. Others talked about in the community they live in Florida, Alzheimer's is particularly stigmatized. It's very interesting when you gather older adults together. <laughs> when someone starts having problems, people move away. It's, you think, oh, we don't care. No. <laughs> um, and so you, this is not a community where you'd let word out that you're in this study. Um, so folks talked about how I told my wife, obviously, but I didn't tell the kids. Why? I don't want them treating me differently. A very common theme was I don't want them treating me differently. Others who did tell their kids said, I wish I hadn't told the kids because now they're haranguing me saying, you got to move closer, you got to move closer, you got to move closer. And I can understand that kid's sentiment, which is if you're on the trajectory of decline and you're living 500 miles away and I'm going to have to help you, this is going to be a real challenge. Would you please pack up and move before closer so we can, I can get that sentiment. I can, I can see that side. Um, others who learned they didn't have elevated amyloid, this, the study we did was people had elevated amyloid. It's funny, you could see their interview. You knew that they didn't have elevated amyloid because you know, as soon as you look at a document and the word pops and relief, they all, it was like they all said relief, relief, it was a relief, it was a relief, it was a relief, it was a relief. And so that juxtaposition of total, I don't have a limited amyloid versus I had, I think provides even more stark contrast. The folks who learned they had a limited amyloid, they didn't, they didn't have catastrophic reactions, et cetera. We had made sure they didn't have, frankly, mental illness that was symptomatic, that is to say anxiety or depression. So they handled it. People handled bad news. Look at what's happened over the last two years. You had a lot of bad news and you handled it. It's amazing how resilient humans are, actually. It's probably why we've survived. Um, one woman who learned she had elevated amyloid, and it's very interesting, the women take it harder than the men, I notice. And I think I'll explain why. She said, you know, I had kind of counted the living dead while I was 85. Kind of, you know, we all kind of think, how much time? That's what I kind of counted on. I kind of counted that I would probably dial out of the workforce around 70, 75. So I had a good 5, 10, 15 years to enjoy, you know, vital life before I became you know, frail and died. But now, this changes that calculus. I'm probably not going to make it to 85, and if I do, the last 10 years probably aren't going to be that good. So, maybe I should retire now. But, I like my work, and also I need to work because I need the money because I'm going to have real needs for my care when I get ill. So I should probably work, but I want to enjoy my life by retirement. So you see what she was dealing with was her time perspective was radically changed, how much time you have left, and how she was going to use that time was radically changed. So if there's a fundamental er theme to all these diseases, it's your perception of your remaining time and what you're going to do with that time. And you're sort of re-engaging in temporal discounting, if you will. So, so this transformation to the biomarker label is extremely exciting. Why would we want people to wait until they're disabled? But I hope I've conveyed to you how it presents a, the neurosciences of this, th these diseases, their transformation by biomarkers, present us a host of cultural, ethical, legal, social challenges. And it truly is that, those, that, that, that set. It's not, one, not any one of those. And everything I've talked about so far is about humans interacting with us. In other words, how will other humans, other minds interact with our minds that are now at risk of becoming damaged minds? So, so far I've just been talking about humans dealing with humans. Let me now expand the conversation to start thinking 
not about humans interacting with humans, but humans interacting with machines. So in addition to the technologies of biomarkers and the drugs, by the way, all of this is contingent on developing drugs that go after the disease, by the way, which is happening a little more stuttering than it would like, sort of statins for the brain, if you will. But what about our relationship with machines? You know, these, these machines are really quite amazing for a number of reasons. Um, one of which is that they just don't do things for us, they can monitor us. And there's a wealth of great data showing that as a brain is failing, you can pick up changes in how people use these machines. So a colleague of mine showed, for example, that as older adults were developing cognitive impairment that you were picking up on their testing, you saw their time on the computer decreasing. They just weren't on the computer as much. Um, any uh, uh, bank or other company that deals with password stuff will tell you, we know when people are having trouble because of the password logon failures. You know, people are having trouble entering their passwords. And you could just go, I mean, these essentially are interfaces with your cortex. And so your ability to use it how you use it is in some sense a measure of your cortex. One of the earliest signs of our brains interacting in the world that was like, when I remember I saw this poster just before the sort of smartphone era. So it was this meticulous study that they would like interview the people every three months and they'd done it older adults for years. And so what they're able to show is well, what things predict decline. And one of the earliest predictors of decline, meaning cognitive decline, in these older adults, meaning they started out normal, but after being in the study for five years, clearly were impaired, was when they looked back, the older adults were, had been reporting less and less tra travel outside their home. So, and they called it shrinking of the life space, meaning they used to take trips here and there, head in New York, they you know, lived in whatever, you know, you know, suburban New Jersey, whatever. And they noticed that the shrinking of travel um, predated symptomatic by our standards, disease. Well, this thing obviously tra tracks you to a T where the hell you are, what you're doing. And so it's just yet another example of how technologies can detect and monitor us. And so we should anticipate a world where our minds, our brains, are extended into technologies that are monitoring and detecting. And now that's very exciting because that takes humans out of the equation. And so all these issues of stigma, et cetera, are off the table. But it creates all sorts of new challenges. Who gets to see that data? Who decides what's abnormal? When something is abnormal, how do you let that be known? Who, you know, who do you tell? Do you, does the machine just say to the person, Jason, you're not traveling as much as you used to. Have you had that memory test again yet? Or does it go to some other trusted person who I've designated as my person who should be told if you start to notice things. Should it be my financial person? Because the ground zero place where these diseases make their most impact early on is with finances. People getting fleeced, making bad investment decisions, etc. So maybe it should be that. Maybe it should be my bank. Maybe my bank should be the first alert that there's something wrong with your brain to then let the doctor know we're concerned about him because he's done cash transfers that he's never done before because we think he's being scammed because he's lost social cognition, because he's got spreading tau and amyloid into his prefrontal cortex. That, that's a very tight story that you could imagine in the future. So we're gonna have a really interesting reconfiguration of how in society we, um, sorry about that, how in society we monitor our brains, who knows that and what they do with it. So, Let's push the machine world. To date, everything I've talked to you about is extended cognition. In other words, this, these devices are sort of extensions of memory, reasoning, other cognitive tasks. But what, we, what we're fascinated about, aren't we, are machines that are extensions not just of our cognition, like a notepad. You don't need a smartphone to make a memo, right? You, as long as you have pencil and paper, that notepad is an extension of your cognition. But what about machines that become extensions of your mind? Not just your cognition, but your mind. And so maybe what I need to talk about is what do we mean when we say mind? But when I say mind, what I think of is not cognition. So for example, showing evidence of speech is not evidence of a mind. And you say, well, that's ridiculous. You know, 
you, you have to talk to be able to have a mind, right? To, to, well, I mean, do you think a three-year-old baby infant has a mind? I hope you do, but it doesn't speak. Do you think your dog has a mind? Do you? I do. My dog has a mind, but my dog doesn't speak. But my dog is very special. He has preferences and he has quirks and behavior. So what? So so not just humans have minds, but a variety of animals have minds. Octopi have wonderful minds. They're actually fabulous minds. Uh, so so minds aren't just cognitive. It's just another way to say cognition. It's a way to say something about certain creatures that's distinct from creatures that don't have minds. Because things that don't have minds, you say, why do we care about minds? Because if something has a mind, you treat it very differently than something that doesn't have a mind, right? You, you can take a, 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 a toy dog, a, 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 an inanimate dog, and if it gets destroyed or whatnot, well, it's sad, a piece of property's been ruined, the child that owned it might be devastated. Indeed, we'll talk more about that in a minute. But fundamentally, we're not mourning the death of that dog. We're just saying, well, you know, the toy broke. But, you know, when the dog gets hit by a car, the living dog, that's awful. I keep on dog issues because I'm sort of trying to get out of the human world. But remember, that child did think for a while that that toy dog had a mind. He gave it a name, she gave it a name, she played with it, she talked to it, etc. So it's funny how we do put minds into things that arguably don't have minds. The mind of God. I'm not going to go there, but think about it. I mean, you know, into these even non-animate things that we can't just know. That's God right there. Sorry. Um, but people think there's a mind in God. Anyway, I ramble, but my point is that we are beginning to think about robots, or, and that's, a, I don't know what the hell a robot actually is, but we're beginning to think about machines that could do things for our minds, that would allow us to perceive the world, which is one thing that minds do. They let us feel the world, right? The taste of coffee, the, 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 the smell of smoke, whatever it may be. And they let us act on our intentions. You know, we, we want something, we, we have an intention, and that's what our minds are, they're intention and feeling. That's what a mind is, those two axes. And some of us are farther along those axes than others. So let me, back to neurodegenerative diseases. Fundamentally, and this is I guess my sort of wrap up point, and I'll come back to now, dementia. If you think about what these diseases do, it's best summed up in a 1984 report written by the Office of Technology Assessment of the United States government. The first report by the US government on Alzheimer's disease, and it was titled, Losing a Million Minds, The Challenge of Alzheimer's to America. Losing a million minds, because that's what you, isn't that what you don't want to lose? You don't want to lose your mind, your sense of identity. And that's what these diseases present us as a challenge. And so, Back to what dementia is, disability. I said it was dis disability where someone has to help someone else do their activities of daily living. And that other person, we call them a caregiver. That's the word of art. And I know when you hear the word caregiver, you think, this is a neuroscience group. I don't care about caregiving. What the hell is that? This is a nursing school. And yet, and yet, I think you should care deeply about caregiving. Because what a caregiver is, is an extension and for someone with Alzheimer's or Lewy body disease or frontal temporal lobar degeneration or vascular dementia or whatever the cause may be. A caregiver is an extension of the person's cognition, help them remember things. If they want, they can be an extension of their mind or they can be even an extension of their self. And I'll give you an example. And I think this is a great example because of who the individual is. So Dan Gibbs, is a retired neurologist. And he's retired because he has Alzheimer's disease. And he wrote about it, a book called A Tattoo on My Brain. He has cognitive problems, he's aware of them. He'll tell you, his memory's not that good. Multitasking is hard. And he got, uh, went to University of California, San Francisco. He practiced up in Portland, but he went to UCSF because there's a great group there, plus he didn't want to be labeled and worked up back in his home institution, back to stigma. Well, obviously he overcame the stigma because he wrote a book about it about his disease. Anyway, he has biomarker-confirmed Alzheimer's. He has elevated amyloid, and he has tau uptake. And he's got cognitive impairment. And he wrote a book about it. Which, I mean, how can someone with Alzheimer's write a book? Well, again, it's a spectrum of disability, right? So he writes this book, and I actually interviewed him for my class um, called The Alzheimer's Crisis that I teach here. And I interviewed him. And um, I'll tell you three things he told me about, told the class about. So he's noticing he's more symptomatic. And why I like Dan's story a lot is he's the ultimate, and 
hybrid that is rare of deep subjective experience of what it's like to have Alzheimer's with intense objective knowledge of it. Because he's a neurologist. He diagnosed people. And he's got a biomarker confirmed. So it's this weird fusion of, I know, I know this disease like a good neurologist, and I have it. And I have the biomarkers of it. So it's, it's an unusual case, truly. Um, so he said, I, you know, I told my class I'm getting more symptomatic. I noticed that. And he said, I, we had our house, we have these refrigerators, those double door refrigerators. And it's one where you can close, the do one door closes, you just push it, but the other door needs an active effort to close it. And he, for whatever reason, has noticed he's just not closing it. Of course, you leave the door open and the alarm goes off and all that other stuff. So he decided he addresses that, but he takes a post-it note and he puts it on the refrigerator door and says, close the door. Close the door. And they have a dog and he puts the dog out in the morning. Now, he lives in a neighborhood where he puts the dog out and if the dog goes out just on its own, it runs around the yard and barks, goes crazy. And that's early in the morning and the neighbors obviously get upset. And what you're supposed to do is put the dog on the leash and go out the leash, the dog on the leash because the dog doesn't go so crazy. Um, you know, excited, but he keeps on forgetting that, and obviously that's disruptive to the neighbors. So he puts a sign on another post-it note: "Leash the dog." Also noticing he's forgetting to take medicines in the morning. Another post-it note: "Take the medicines." So each example, and it's I like that it's a post-it note, are extensions of his cognition. His brain is slowly, mind is reaching out into the world to still function. I'm going to put these post-it notes that are reliable, trustworthy, and consistent, which is what an extended mind is, something that's reliable, trustworthy, and consistent, to help me still be Dan Gibbs. Use the refrigerator, take care of the dog, take my medications. No humans involved. Now, a human could do those things, but those are all I would argue, those post-it notes are part of Dan's mind. I would argue they are. They're reliable, they're consistent, they're dependable, they're needed for him to function as Dan Gibbs, and not forget to take his meds, take care of the dog, and not spoil the food in the refrigerator. He lives in Portland, Oregon, a terribly progressive city. They have an arts tax, being Portland, uh, to help support the arts. It's not a mandatory tax because in America you can't have a mandatory tax for the arts because that would be like, I don't know what. So it's a, it's a voluntary tax, but it's called a tax in an effort to make people pay it and feel like they're contributing, right? So he, for years, has paid the arts tax, his arts tax. And, uh, you know, gets a computer, gets an email, time to pay your arts tax, click in, go to your account, you know, give them the payment information, and you paid your arts tax. And this is around the time that he said, I've turned the checkbook over to my wife. So the checkbook now, that he can't get a machine to do, although maybe someday a robot could do it. Um, so now a new device enters in, which is his wife. And she's managing the checkbook. So she, in some sense, is an extension of his mind. Take care of the checkbook, right? So he's got post-it notes, and he's got his wife, who's his mind. But the arts tax, he doesn't have to pay it. He has to pay his checkbook, pay the bills. Someone has to. Take care of the dog. So all those things are necessary for human flourishing. But he doesn't have to pay the arts tax. No, the city of Portland will not say, you haven't paid your arts tax, you're being fined, like, if you don't pay your income tax, you will get fined. You know, that is the federal government, the IRS will come after you. You have to pay your income tax. If you don't pay your income tax, that's criminal. Or whatever, I don't know. It's a crime. What, I don't do, it's a tort. I don't know what the hell it is. Anyway. But his wife says, don't worry about it, Dan. Have the email, change the email for your account to mine. And next year, I'll get the email. It's time for Dan Gibbs to pay his arts tax. And I'll pay. And I would argue that's his wife in a very focused and subtle way saying, I'm not just your extended cognition, your post-it note, flesh and blood. I'm your extended mind and self. Because for Dan to be Dan, he pays the arts tax because he believes in the arts. I like the arts. And now he knows I might not be able to do that anymore. And his wife stepped in and said, I'll do it for you. I'll help you still be you even when you can't be you. And that's what a caregiver is. And that's why these diseases are so fascinating. Because what they do is they put together the neurosciences, biomarkers, networks, technology to detect subtle changes in those networks with philosophy, 
with the ethic of humans caring for other minds, caring for other selves. And that's the future. I predict the future of this disease will be the philosophy of the mind, of the self, working with the neurosciences to better put together those two areas so that in the end very practical things will happen that we can live with our minds threatened to be damaged or damaged and move away from that woman who's worried I want to retire but I can't have money etc they don't want to tell the kids if they know they'll treat me could we look back on that era and say that's the way it was before we thought thoughtfully about how to integrate the neurosciences with our philosophy so exciting times for all of you because you're going to work in that Thanks a lot. I don't know if you wanted to have as questions or anything like that, or I'm happy to linger for a bit. Yeah, um, are you willing to be like just a short Q&A? If you'd like. I don't want to put you on the spot. Or, you, know, you don't have to ask me any questions. <laughs> if you want to hit the donuts. And, <laughs> I didn't know people still got Dunkin' Donuts. <laughs> I guess uh, just before the Q&A, just a round of applause. Thank oh, you. Oh, thank you. Yeah, if any questions, happy to answer them. Like, you know, how do I get into med school? Or yeah. <laughs> I, I would ask that, but I No, you don't ask that. <laughs> um, so I'm wondering if you have any um, thoughts on the ethics of actually um, looking at these biomarkers for somebody, uh, because not just telling people that you have, um, I don't remember what it was, elevated tau, um, yeah. something, something um, but knowing it yourself, and the distress that that could cause in your life, um, do you feel that the distress that that causes weighed with maybe what preventative measures somebody could take, um, it would be worthwhile for somebody to know that? Or do you think there might be an ethical reason for someone not to know? That's the old, that's an that's open question. You know, what you're describing is stereotype threat, which is a very form of stigma, self-stigma. I've learned something about myself that changes how I perceive myself and how I perceive my, my, my capacities, my abilities, and I think differently of myself. Um, again, humans are very resilient. After getting bad news, we feel bad for a while, we think ill, and then we kind of bounce back and carry on. Um, nonetheless, I think it's an open question. Um, it's something we've studied. Um, you know, the key missing actor there is, yeah, I've learned this bad news. I've got, you know, elevated synuclein, but I'm on the anti-synuclein therapy. And I'm hoping that that, and hope is the operative word here, slows down the trajectory of decline. How powerful that therapy is, how effective it is, how long it works are all things that will be up for grabs. I'll ramble and then stop for another question. I think one of the hot button challenges that these diseases are going to face us is the following. I'll give you another anecdote. When I was a boy, Mr. Hopper, a guy across the street, like worked in his yard all the time, he's retired, it was like, it looked like he vacuumed his grass and took such care of his yard. Anyway, shoving the snow, grabs his chest, hits the ground, he's dead in four hours. Okay, that's the way heart attacks happened back then. Fast forward a few years later, same thing, neighbor, you know, same thing, shovel the snow, heart attack, gets a stent, gets a bypass, and he lives for another 15 years with all kinds of cardiac devices, but eventually he does die, he does. He's actually, he like died, and the devices were still firing away. So now to the brain. Unless we have treatments that just shut down the pathology, like it's gone, it's like vaccinated for, for uh, um, uh, I was gonna say COVID, so COVID vaccination, uh, uh, polio. Um, Unless we have treatments like that, we're going to face a very interesting challenge, which is it's not working anymore. I'm still, I've gotten sicker. My monitoring devices are showing like I'm not as well as I used to be. And I think that will be the ground zero challenge for what next, you know, like back to the neighbor, the second neighbor. Like at some point he was getting very disabled despite his cardiac disease being treated. Well, imagine when it's your brain that's getting disabled and there's this treatment you're on. When do you stop it and what would you say? So those will be some of the challenges that you all can work on. So it's your job. Get, get to it. <laughs> what else? Yeah. yeah. Um, I was going to ask that um, combined idea of biomarkers and also genetic markers. Yeah. Um, do you envision that becoming more of a political issue in the future when you know employers are going to start if if to, if it's allowed that for employers to start using that information? Yeah. You know? It's a. It is. The law is incomplete in this space. Does it? Decent but incomplete law around genetics, the GINA Act, Genetic Non-Discrimination Act that was passed in the Obama administration, provides some protection based on genetic results. Uh, there's no protection in contrast for, for someone with a biomarker type result. And I think that'll be another area where there's just going to need to be the, 
if it's not legislation, the other place obviously is the courts. You know, this will work out through a case in the court where someone claims discrimination on the basis of, uh, of a biomarker result um, in the absence of having any symptoms and signs. Yeah, I predict that that'll be the case. With regards to, I guess, current value of like clinical trials for like Alzheimer's, yeah. Yeah, so the, the question was, um, how do you distinguish between normal aging type changes versus changes of disease? Yeah, you navigate that. yeah you, you'd like to navigate it with drugs that change the trajectory of decline because when the drug works, whatever that means, it suggests that whatever you were measuring was pathology, at least as we understand it sociologically, is, is causing bad things, so let's call it a disease. Um, but none of the drugs really work yet, so. Um, it, 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 drugs to carve out diseases and separate disease from aging. And I'll give you one anecdote. I think I, I think you were in a class. I lecture that. Um, I remember when elevated blood pressure in very older adults, the top number was considered normal aging. It was that what we called it normal aging because you had to maintain a pressure head to your head, whatever the hell that means. Um, and then we did a clinical trial. I didn't do it. Other people, <laughs> where they lowered the blood pressure, and it, lo and behold, it reduced stroke and heart attack in these aging. And so suddenly, elevated blood pressure was no longer aging, it was the disease called systolic hypertension. And so that's, I think, what will happen with the brain as drugs start to change trajectories, which is weird when you think about how drugs then define what's normal or not, and the fact that drugs are owned and marketed, I mean, it's sort of like, you know, like, you sort of get issues of identity and control there, which, you know, if you were, yeah, so, anyway. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, you mentioned a couple times that the progression of treatment right now is pretty slow. Yeah. I just wondering if there were any other treatments or drugs in research or in trial that you find particularly promising. Well, the, the disaster has been this drug that the company called Biogen studied and put and got approved by FDA under accelerated approval called aducanumab, marketed as aducanumab. It's just been an absolute disaster of politics, uh, conflicts of interest, regulatory capture. It's just a tragic story. Uh, that ultimately just two days ago resulted in the Center for Medicare Services saying we'll only pay for the drug if you're in a study to prove the drug actually works because FDA approved it on the basis of intermediate endpoints. So that's just been a just a, a horrible disaster in the field, dividing the field. Um, it's a little like the Book of Job, but you know, the Book of Job kind of going along, all of a sudden disaster happens, and then at the end everything's back to normal in Job's life. And in some sense, on June 6th, before the drug was approved, you know, it was like, well, it needs more study. FDA's not going to approve it. FDA decided to approve it. But we're right back to June 6th, because the only way you can get the drug is for a study designed to prove whether the drug works. So it's like the whole last year and a half has been this kind of like, you know, book of Job for all the Alzheimer's field. Having said that, there are three drugs that are in under uh, last bits of development. The data are rolling in. No more people are getting enrolled. So they're taking the drug. So in this September, we'll hear about two drugs, and then in May of 2023, about a year from now, we'll hear about a third drug. So about a year from now, not one, but three other drugs, out of Canada, that's the one, we'll have heard about. And I think at the end of that, we'll sort of take stock and say, so are these drugs working and moving the field forward, or are we kind of down a path that just doesn't seem to be very promising? So we'll see. It'll be very interesting. Um, uh, and I'll leave it at that. Yeah. yeah. And, and the way back, just to because my eyesight tends to be this way, so I'm like slight blind. So let me go to you, because we'll go way back. And then, yeah. Go ahead. Um, yeah, I have an ethical question about your final point about preserving the mind. Yeah. Um, and to what extent we stop doing that? Because in your example, um, he wants to pay the arts tax, and he knows I'm probably not going to have the ability to do that because I'm going to forget. So my wife is going to do it for me and thus preserve my mind. But at the point where he loses like his allegiance to the arts, not where he at the point where he's like, I no longer know that I enjoy the arts. Right. So he's losing that inclination. Is the wife still to pay the tax? And is that still a preservation of his mind? And how do we kind of reconcile that idea where are we just now honoring the past version of himself? Yeah. And is that ethical because that's no longer who he is? Yeah. Um, so in, in the, the what you've, what you've uh, nicely summarized is this debate between, in the care of someone with a, a, a progressive neurodegenerative disease, do you treat them according to the wishes of the now self that's there telling you what their intentions are, 
or do you treat them according to their then self, the person in the past who said, this is what I would want. And um, what we've been working on, in some sense, not in some sense, but using, frankly, the approaches of empirical bioethics, is to start asking caregivers how they do perceive the mind of the patient. I'm a doctor, so I tend to call people patients if they have a disease. Um, and what we found, what we're finding is, we don't ask them how do you perceive the mind of your relative. It's a little like, you know. <laughs> and yet, it's interesting if you ask them questions about mind, they're very eager to answer them. And what many of them tell you is, he's there but not there. And they live this almost like looking at the relative like a cubist painting. In other words, I, I see the woman, or the man, or the bull, a la Picasso, but it's a distortion of, you know, you see what I'm getting at? And, I, and so it's not so simple as the then self, now self. I'm not, I'm slightly alighting over your question, but bits are there, but bits are not there. And they struggle with this ambiguity and they essentially can't resolve it. They say, I, I, I don't know. They, all, the interviews, they all, say, they all end, not end with, but they have these like, I just don't know, or it's so hard to tell, or I might be wrong, or it could be the other way. So it gets back to your case. I suppose you could say, well, if you adamantly said, the arts suck, you know, why are we here? You know, I guess you could say, all right, no more arts tax. You know, it's, what's the cost? Um, and so you would say, it's just a preferential interest. Like, I like chocolate, you know, fine, eat chocolate. He always hated it, now he does. You know, there's a great case we had of an Orthodox Jewish patient who uh, adhered to the strict dietary rules of Orthodox Judaism, who was eating bacon off of other patients' plates in the nursing home, and the family utterly freaked out, and the staff are like, but he wants the bacon, so what do we, you know? And I know it sounds funny, but you're like, that's the dilemma. And it, it's funny, these, the stories, the topics are quotidian, but for the families, this is ground zero. I mean, this stuff is big, because it's like, this is my father. He's a Orthodox Jew. He doesn't eat bacon. Stop it. Uh, the other one we've had are sex stuff. So folks who start having sexual relations, you know, with, and they still have a wife or a husband, or it's a different gender than they used to prefer, and <laughs> families are like, and it's a struggle. Uh, yeah. Uh, there was a question in front. Yeah. I wanted to ask about the biomarker. So when you see in a patient or a person when they have these elevated like tau levels or these elevated amyloid beta levels, does that directly mean in the future they will develop Alzheimer's? No, it's a, it, it, it's it's more of an actuarial thing. Um, mm -hmm. And you, we're beginning to sort of uh, uh, tease out in addition to the biomarkers what frankly predicts your risk. You know, you, you, there's no thing, you, you, there's a website called FRAX, F-R-A-X, FRAX, and you take your bone mineral density, which is how thick your bones are, along with your gender, uh, your age, whether you smoke cigarettes, and uh, your weight, and your height, and you enter all that in, and you get back a number that says what your chance of a fracture is. So it's not just bone mineral density that determines that. And many argue that that'll be the future for this disease. Namely, sure, there's this biomarker, but, you're 95 years old, and in 95-year-olds with that biomarker, that we see a very different rate of progression. This is the case, actually, compared to a 60-year-old. And it's not just because the 95-year-old could die at any minute on an actuarial basis, but if there's something different about these biomarkers based on age, for example. So I think we'll have this more nuanced sort of, what's your age, what's the size and structure of your brain, probably genetics, who knows what will go into the pot that'll lead to that. So those of you who are interested in Frankly, economics are going to have a great time because it'll be the world of risk modeling and whatnot. Um, and there's no question that actuarial ideas will invade the brain. You know, what's my risk? You know, you see, you know, you old friends who are older who are like, they have like rules at dinner parties, no talk about body parts because everyone starts talking about their test results, you know, and like what their LDL is and whatnot. And you kind of see a little sort of, you know, HDL. Uh, braggadocio, like, you know, I've got the good cholesterol, like, I have an HDL of 100. <laughs> so, anyway, will that happen with the brain? Like, you know, I don't know, we'll see. Uh, interesting. There was another, yeah, right there. Yeah. Um, on the point of economics, um, you touched on this a little bit um, under, uh, about public health and how that sphere will be impacted as time goes forward as the country's average age starts to increase. And, yeah. Uh, um, I was just curious about, because it seems like economists are always talking about, like, you know, we're killing all this national debt and, you know, Social Security and it's going to be so much more people that we're going to have to have yeah. under, this, under this roof. 
Um, how do you see that kind of progressing? In terms of well, they were telling that story for the last 40 years and we're still around um, as a country. So, look, you know, I get the, the apocalyptic arguments about aging and disease in America. You know, the elderly are going to bankrupt America, so we can't pay for what they need. But the dirty secret is we are paying. Your families are paying. I know in this room there are people whose family has someone with dementia, and I know that generally the women in that family have foregone work or reduced their work commitments to take care of that relative, which means they're not earning income, they're not paying into Social Security, um, they're not contributing to the productivity of our nation. I know that. So that's the cost, but that's off the books. So when, you know, God love him, Rick Scott, the senator from uh, 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 Florida, who's getting to run for president, talks about, you know, we're going to return all social programs locally, if not at all, because we don't want the American family being treated by the state. Well, what he's essentially saying is the American family is going to lose money. Because what he's saying to the daughters and daughters-in-law, mostly in America, because it's mostly women who do this, is you're going to have to take care of your demented relative excuse my language, because we're not going to pay. So you're not going to go to school, or you're not going to advance at work, or you're not going to contribute to Social Security. So yeah, you're right. Long-term care will cost billions of dollars. <coughs> billions. Triple digit, if we did it. But we're losing those money now. You're losing. Your family's losing. It's hysterical. Yeah. Yeah, so how I became a writer? Yeah, because yeah, I'm a writer. <laughs> yeah, I was a writer before I was a writer. I guess. No, I, I'm not joking. I mean, I think it's just a talent. Excuse me saying that because that's a little presumptuous. But it's just something you want to do. I, I think it's no different than why do you, why do you run you know, or swim or play a cello? You know, I think it's, 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 it's as burr as that. So I always liked writing. Um, you know, why I became a doctor, I don't know, whatever. Uh, no. <laughs> Uh, the two kind of go together. It works for me. You know, um, I, I don't mean to be flippant, but it, you know, in the end, I know there's a you know, everyone wants to be a total wannabe or whatever, and you know, the right knows so Arthur Booker G or whatever. I get it, but in the end, you know, you know these are just do you want to do this? So anyway, so I'm being very kind of uh, rambling about this. Um, I liked going into academics because I liked asking and answering questions and whatnot, and doing research in addition to taking care of patients. Um, uh, and part of why I liked academics and why I like it is you get to write. And the work in bioethics, I write essays and things like that. And I just at some point uh, decided I had this, you know, that I wanted to expand my writing, literally. I, I was tired of writing academic papers. They're, they're very formulaic, and that's fine. It's very interesting in the formula. And I, I had this idea for the novel, so I wrote that. And then, you know, the work in Alzheimer's, I saw there's so many interesting themes here that are better said in a book than all these little academic papers. And so so it, it kind of comes from that, you know. Um, I'm happy to talk more offline, but I, uh, yeah. So, I'm mindful that pizza arrived, I want to keep you from it. And we're sort of, so let me take you know, one more question, and then, yeah. Sorry, um, just going back to the biomarkers, do you believe that's a test for like how and amyloid should be done routinely? Like, routinely, like, or like, routinely? You're a little muffled, I'm so sorry, if you just lower your mask. Just speak really loud. So like back to the biomarkers, do you think uh, the test for like amyloid and tau should be done routinely or like based on I guess the prevalence of disease? Do you think that's like not necessary? Yeah, so I think this is where the uh, the actuaries will step in. You know, when will these tests be rolled out? So for example, you know, um, right now in America you turn fifty and you get a colonoscopy. Happy birthday. Um, <laughs> turn 40, you get an LDL test. If you're a woman, there's a lot of debate. If, if, if you were biologically have, 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 have a, 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 a women's breasts, you get um, a mammogram and people debate what age to get it. I think that'll be the case with these diseases based on certain characteristics, when and what tests will be given. And I think so people talk about, you know, maybe there'll be a genetic test for some of the common genes and based on that, maybe it'll be Age, I think that's to be worked out, but I think that'll be that'll, that that's going to keep the actuaries busy a lot. That'll be you can make a career on that one. I can tell you right now, <laughs> if, if you're into numbers, I just wrote your uh, just got you a job. All right, last question. Yeah, one last question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I have this question more about philosophy. It's like what you said about Alzheimer's and disability, um, because it's, it's like like philosophy. Like, 
Yeah, no, I mean, all, all diseases exist in part because we say they exist, and, and, we, and that's how we respond to it as a disease. So, yeah, I mean, if you have a culture that does not feature self, self-determination um, as a cherished value, um, also emphasizes communal nature of um, obligations, you would find it hard to call what we call Alzheimer's, Alzheimer's, until perhaps someone's very impaired and disabled, bathing and dressing, or very disordered in terms of uh, uh, psych psychopathology, like de de uh, delusions, et cetera. And that kind of was what senility was. So senility was sort of this extreme stage of, quote, aging. Back when we, half of adults weren't allowed to be autonomous, women, people of color, et cetera. Um, and also we had strong familial structures of obligations for care that had were baked into just the family structure. So the latter, I think, is actually one of the most important, I think. So what, what am I talking about? There's a, a book of, uh, the book of Ruth in the Bible, uh, the Old Testament books, um, is the story of Ruth, who was daughter-in-law to her widowed mother-in-law, Naomi. And, uh, and Naomi says to Ruth, like, well, you're widowed, I'm widowed, you're gonna go back and get a husband, because that's what you need, I'm too old, so just let me be, I'll die. I mean, such as what she says. And Naomi says, no, I'm, I'll, I'm here for you. Wherever you go, I go. Wherever you are, I am. Right? So she's the story of Ruth, the devoted daughter-in-law, caring for her widowed mother-in-law. And everyone reads that, and they go, quote that line, wherever you go, I go, whatever. At weddings, it's a very popular sort of reading at weddings. Nowhere in the book of Ruth is Ruth called Naomi's caregiver. She's just a good daughter-in-law doing what good daughter-in-laws do. So culturally, if you bake in the idea, like, there's no distinct role of caregiver, it's just being a family member. You really normalize like disability because there's just someone that's always gonna take care of us, it. just what we do. And they say, well, but it is what we do, but it isn't what we do. You have to make the choice to be a caregiver. And that, I really strongly believe in that, as opposed to it's just expected you're gonna be a caregiver. And in fact, that word caregiver is actually a very modern word. If you search on an engram, a Google engram for caregiver, it didn't exist before 1980. It did not exist in the English language. No one talked about caregiving before 1980. And it existed after 1980 because Alzheimer's became recognized as a disease after 1980. And the two had to go together. So it is totally culturally constructed in that sense. I agree with you. So you want to solve Alzheimer's? Don't let women work? <laughs> don't, don't move far from your family? You know, and we'll solve this problem that way. But I don't think that that's fair for people's autonomy and self determination. So I will choose to make it a disease, and it is a choice, which I would rather be honest than pretend otherwise. Anyway, I had a great time. Uh, thanks a lot. All right, I'll see you guys. I'm gonna go, uh, go hit spring play. <laughs> All right, hey y'all. We're going to be transitioning to the second phase of. Uh, if anyone, by the way, ever just drop me a note if you want to chat or whatever. You know, excellent. I, one great thing about Penn is it's all on one campus. So. Yeah, yep, yeah. And we can send out his contact information. Thank you, doctor. It's on the web. Yep. <laughs> Yeah, so while Aaron transitions us to the second phase of the Expo RC membership, if you guys want to just finish getting setting up and maybe grab some of the pizza, um, yeah, Aaron, take it away. I yeah, hope you guys enjoyed the keynote with Dr. Carlos. He's a pretty cool guy if you didn't know pick up on that. But yeah, they're just transitioning to the second part of the actual Expo. Um, so yeah, pizza is in the back. While the RC members are getting set up with their poster presentations, uh, you can just like sit, relax for like a few minutes, and then um, once everyone's set up, you guys can like walk around, have some pizza, and then just like engage with the RC members uh, as they're talking about their research. So um, enjoy this part.